Courtesy of the Prime Minister's Prizes for Science, I'm here today to talk about some recent innovations in nanotechnology and to present some uh, reasons why my old BFF diamond is now emerging as a preferred candidate for the next generation of tools in areas in biology and medicine. Some of you may be wondering what we mean when we say nanotechnology. Well, very briefly, it's uh, devices and capabilities that are based on discrete pieces of matter uh, roughly the same diameter as a strand of DNA. That's about a uh, thousand times smaller than a red blood cell and about 10,000 times smaller than a single strand of human hair. What's a very big deal about the very, very small? Well, ultimately nanotechnology is going to deliver us a lot of interesting new capabilities, but what we really want is firstly to make things cheaper, to use much smaller quantities of our very rare and expensive commodities. And this is not just because we all want cheaper gadgets in our home. I believe it's also because it's important nanotechnology doesn't become another technology of the rich out of the reach of third world countries. We also want to make our existing devices more efficient while still retaining the same function and the same types of components. Increasing energy tech, uh, efficiency is a great example of this. And the last thing that we're all trying to achieve is to be able to do a range of new things that we've never been able to do before, of course. Now, these nanotechnology futures, if you will, are likely to have a big impact in a lot of areas, way too many for me to go into today. So I'm just going to take a moment later to talk about the last one here on this very short list. Researchers in all areas of science and engineering all around the world are very, very active in this area. But the question I get asked most is, when are we going to see a return on all this investment? Well, the truth is there are lots of products entering the market all the time. But the mass influx that I think we're all hoping for is unlikely to occur because it takes time for us to make sure that the safest and most environmentally friendly version of this new technology is ultimately the one that reaches the shelves. But to give you an idea of what's going on behind the scenes, I'll pull away the curtain, and I'm going to show you some recent results of my own and my colleagues, science is very collaborative, on nano diamond. Okay, so diamonds are made of carbon, irrespective of the size. And the diamonds that are used in industry or those we see in stores have a very large overall surface area. But most of those carbon atoms are actually located within the bulk or within the body of the diamond. This means that the properties are dominated by the bulk, and we see things like extreme hardness, excellent thermal conductivity, good electrical insulation. Nano diamonds are different. Now, here we're looking at an uh, image taken with an electron microscope of real nano diamonds. Scale there is two nanometers. So the dark patches are real nano diamonds, and you can probably see there are stripes, there are sort of linear planes here. Those are actual planes of carbon atoms. In an individual basis, each of these nano diamonds has a very small overall surface area, but the majority of its carbon atoms are located on or near the surface. That means that the properties of nano diamonds are dominated by surface effects, and of course, are very big, very different, sorry, to big diamonds. If we zoom in and look at a particular nano diamond and look at its surfaces, we find that actually some of those surfaces are not diamond like at all. They're more like a fullerene, like a, uh, the soccer ball shaped molecule I showed on my first slide. Those are shown here in blue. The rest of the nano diamond, the core and the remaining surfaces, are diamond like. They're shown in yellow. And it's the mixture of the two that gives rise to what we call anisotropy. And that anisotropy can be very, very useful. Take, for example, the surface electrostatic potential. This is just how the electrons are arranged on the surface, but it determines how they interact with everything around them, including each other. And we find that there are positive or negative or neutral patches, and that's not the case in big diamonds. Now, based on this, a lot of people think positive and negative. They attract, right? Very true, and they attract in nano diamond as well. But we find that uh, the preferred configurations are actually when positive neutral 
or negative neutral facets interact. And we can calculate the probabilities of different types of patterns forming. And we can also explain the amazing long-range self-assembly of these particles into linear chains and networks and fibers. Here are some uh, fibers of nanodiamond produced by my friend and colleague Ijiasara in Japan. Now these are fibers of all little five nanometer sized diamonds all lined up. You'll note here that the scale is a steel ruler that you'd find in a classroom. And some of these fibers are over a centimeter long. That means there's two million nanodiamonds all lined up along the length of these fibers and they got that way on their own. Try getting two million people to line up on their own. <laughs> okay. So why is all this useful? Good question. Well, uh, this tells us a couple of important things. Firstly, that we can use the natural size and shape of nanodiamonds uh, for amazing applications without needing to re-engineer them. It also means that we can use, uh, uh, sorry, we can manipulate the chemical and electronic properties using existing technologies. So nanodiamonds, unlike a lot of other nanoparticles, can be selectively, reliably controlled. They also have another great advantage, or three more great advantages. They're cheap, they're easy to produce, and they're non-toxic. This is an amazing resume for a nanoparticle. And based on this amazing resume, nanodiamonds have got themselves a new job in the area of uh, cancer treatment. So I'm going to just quickly run through that application. So cancer cells contain, among other things, cancer-specific DNA, which distinguishes them from other cells, and cancer-specific receptors. Now, scientists have been very diligent and have produced some lovely biomarker molecules which can identify and interact with the receptors, specifically. We've also developed chemotherapy drugs which intercalate or cut up the DNA and kill the cell indiscriminately. So how do we get the two of these to work together? Well, by combining both molecules with nanodiamonds that have been functionalized with or coated with oxygen-containing groups, we can actually get the two of them to be carried together so the drug is delivered at the same time that the marker is activated. This whole combination can be suspended in water and then used as an injectable therapy or used as an active layer in a patch type situation. So this work is being underway at Northwestern University by my colleague, Professor Dean Ho. And his group has already shown in mouse studies that when combined with nanodiamond, the drugs are more targeted to cancer cells as opposed to regular cells, that they need around 20 times less drug to deliver the same treatment, that the drug is delivered much more slowly rather than a burst release at the start of a therapy that's uh, typical of chemotherapy, and they can deliver it over many months, over a lot longer period of time, which means that the need for repeated treatments is reduced. Now, when this technology comes out, I think we all know what that's going to mean. And although I didn't have a lot of time to go into it today, they have, nanodiamond has another great advantage. They fluoresce when they're exposed to certain laser frequencies. This is great for all sorts of applications in quantum computing or quantum information processing, but it's also great for medical diagnostics. Shown here is a tumor cell, and uh, next to it is, uh, with an electron microscope image, Next to it is a fluorescence image of the same tumor. The blue is a normal fluorescent dye, and the green dots are actual 35 nanometer nanodiamonds all clustered around the cell. So using, if we combine the optical properties with the chemical and the electronic properties, we may actually be able to see that the drugs are being delivered where, they need, where they're needed most. Can you imagine that? Well, thank you very much for listening, and I hope you agree we're entering a diamond age of nanotechnology.